study tonight since this is a normal day for us to meet and, and clearly we're still shut down for public assembly. We're actually uh, shut down now through April 1st and then we'll reevaluate. Hopefully we're getting closer and closer to normality but I'm um, hearing good things from all of you. Everybody seems to be doing pretty well and uh, we're seeing opportunities to serve our community and things like that. And um, just looking forward to what God's going to do through all of this. But we're glad you, you can be a part of the study tonight. Um, I'm broadcasting from a little different spot. I think all the, the um, studies, sermons, and so forth we've done so far have been from a different location. Um, if you're familiar with our, our meeting place, uh, you may know where I am right now. Uh, if, if not, uh, come by sometime and find where I am, but it is sort of a neat spot in, in our building. Um, you know, we talk of, of good-hearted people, and we love good-hearted people, and, and, and we, we speak sometimes of brave-hearted people. Uh, how about strong-hearted people, or God-hearted people? Have you ever just read through the life of David. Uh, you know, there is a lot of space in the Bible devoted to David. In fact, 42 straight chapters in the books of Samuel and Kings, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 42 chapters in a row are focused on the life and times of David. So, 42 out of 102 chapters in those four books are about David. Uh, 1 Samuel 16 through 1 Kings 2 covers less than 50 years in David's life um, from age 22 to age 70. You compare that to any other king and you'll see what exclusive coverage David gets. He also gets um, 19 chapters in the book of 1 Chronicles. So when you talk about reading through David's life, there's a lot of material. Uh, most people, when they think of David, they know about David and Goliath, that story. They know about the story of David and Bathsheba. And those two stories combined are about three of those 50 plus chapters that we can read about David. So there's a lot more about this individual than, than the story of Goliath and the story of Bathsheba. When you read carefully the story of David, there are several, I guess what I would call, breathtaking moments. Both good breathtaking and bad breathtaking. And I want to look at one of the good breathtaking moments uh, with you tonight in this study. It's one of those David stories where you look at it and consider it and you begin to see a bit what God saw in David and why David came to be known as a man after God's heart. Uh, that's a phrase most of us are familiar with. It actually comes from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 22. Paul is preaching there in a Jewish synagogue in the city of Antioch of Pisidia. And he's rehearsing some of Israel's history to his hearers. And he mentions King Saul, who of course was the first king. He mentions him in uh, Acts 13, 21. And then 
Uh, he, he talks about how God removed Saul, and instead he raised up David to be the next king. And he says about that quote, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Another port, important verse uh, in understanding why David is in a special category is in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4. The topic there is actually the third king of Israel, Solomon. David's son. And it tells this sad story of how Solomon was led away from God by the many uh, foreign wives that he married and, and who really pulled him and influenced him to worship other gods. It says in verse 3 there, 1 Kings 11, that his wives turned away his heart. And then in verse 4 it says this, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now there's the difference. Um, David, of course we know, was far from perfect. He did some awful things, but his heart was always loyal to Yahweh God. He never went after other gods. Uh, never, as far as we know, did he ever break the first commandment, which was, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, we know that Saul did. King Saul broke that commandment. We know Solomon did. And most all of the kings did. David apparently did not. He was a devoted Yahweh man. He was what we're calling tonight a strong-hearted man. Now, the breathtaking story that I want us to read and reflect on tonight is found in 1 Samuel chapter 30. It comes in the period of David's life before he becomes king in Jerusalem. Uh, he's in fact wandering about in the wilderness with about 600 other men. They're they're warriors, mighty men, Scripture calls them. And it's a little bit, uh, out, out in the wilderness of Judea, it's a little bit like the wild, wild west. Uh, David and his band of outlaws are some of the baddest dudes out there. And he's on the run. He's on the run from King Saul. Saul has sent out assassin squads who want David dead. And so David is a wanted man in the wild, wild west. And he's been actually already anointed king, anointed as the next king by the prophet Samuel. And Saul, of course, hates him because of this. And so the chase is on. And Saul is trying to eliminate his rival for the throne. And one of the things that, that David has been doing is acting as sort of a, a double agent. Um, he's pretending to fight on the side of the enemy, uh, that is, the, the Philistines, while all the while he's been actually slaughtering as many Philistines as possible. And, and what's happened leading up to 1 Samuel chapter 30 is that Israel, led by King Saul, has drawn up in battle against Philistia. And many of the Philistines don't trust having this Israelite, David, in their midst. So they send him home, and they don't allow him to participate in the coming battle, fearing that he might turn on them. And frankly, they were probably right. Well, it's in that battle uh, that King Saul will be killed, and also his son Jonathan is killed. And... Uh, that, that actually takes place after the story I want us to study together for a moment. Uh, so David and his mighty men, they've been sent home from this looming battle. Their home was a, a little town, a village probably called Ziklag. It's about 80 miles from where they were in chapter 29. The text says that they make it 
to Ziklag in three days. They traverse 80 miles in three days, which meant that they rode hard. And the Old West term was rode hard and put away wet. Uh, they were exhausted when they arrived, and, and that only made things worse when they discovered the disaster that had occurred while they were away. So let's read a portion of this in 1 Samuel 30, and then take our message, our lesson uh, from these verses. Right at the beginning of the chapter, 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 10. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives had also been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, and the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He was answered, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and they and shall surely rescue them. So David set out, and the six hundred men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, where, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. Well, while David and his men, you know, were sort of off playing war, this wandering band of Amalekites, really terrorists, burned their city to the ground and took off with all their wives and children. Uh, presumably to keep them as slaves or, or perhaps sell them into slavery. And who could really blame David and his men for the, the great lamentation that went up that day when they discovered what had happened? What a terrible, terrible day. And, and what happens then and, and how the various parties react and how David reacts goes a long way in explaining why David was so special and goes a long way to show us what a strong-hearted, God-hearted person looks like. David's 600 men, mighty men, men of renown uh, for their skills in battle and war, they fall apart uh, emotionally when they're confronted with the loss of their families. And they are embittered because of it. It says in verse 6, they are bitter in soul. And this is really actually these guys reverting to what they were like when David first found them. Um, they hadn't always been brave, mighty men. If you go back to chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, you see the origin of this group of men. Um, in, in chapter 22, David again is on the run from Saul. He's hiding in a cave in the wilderness. And he begins to gather to himself some family members. And it says in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, 
and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. So uh, these men, when David first met them, for various reasons, no doubt, were bitter. They were bitter in soul. They were stressed out, um, sort of cast outs from polite society, we might say. And David turned them into the, the fiercest fighting force in the country. And now, when this disaster strikes, they're full of bitterness again. And they're ready to stone to death the man whom they were ready to die for not long before. You know, we find out how strong our heart is when stress comes, when disaster strikes, when difficulties arise. That's when we find out what we're really like. Um, do we play the blame game? Do we lash out? Well, these men did. And as I think about it, I, I may well have joined them. If my family had been torn away from me, I may well have reacted the same way. Maybe you too. So David finds himself in a tight spot. This is exactly uh, what the text says here. When it says he's greatly distressed, the word there means to be restricted, to be cramped, to be bound up. He's in a tight spot, a tough spot. You've got 600 bloodthirsty men who want him dead, plus the fact that his own wives and children are missing as well. How will David respond? Well, before we answer that, one other comparison. King Saul, back to Saul for a moment, and not, not long before this, he found himself in a, tight, in a tough spot, a tight spot uh, as well. If you go back just a few pages to chapter 28 of 1 Samuel, uh, verse 15, Saul says this, I am in great distress. It's actually the exact same word used of David here. Saul is facing this war with the Philistines and he really didn't like his odds. He seemed to have no one to call on. He's alienated from his God. He doesn't know what to do. So, what did he do? He sought out a witch, a medium, to answer his questions. Um, we might say he turned to the dark side. And that tells us a lot about the state of the heart of King Saul. David, on the other hand, when he found himself hard-pressed on every side, um, what was he like? What did he do? How did he respond? Well, the end of verse 6 of 1 Samuel 30, to me, is just so powerful, so insightful. It says there, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Just meditate on that for a moment. That is as strong as it can be. That is a strong-hearted man. David strengthened himself in the Lord as God. He didn't lash out. He didn't respond with anger and violence. He didn't find someone to blame. David found strength in God. You see, David, his whole life was a man of the Lord. That's what made him great. It's what made him a man after God's own heart. In the words of Paul, many centuries later. You know, David, you'd never find David reading his horoscope or buying off a witch or finding someone to, to contact dead spirits for him. David sought God in difficult times. 
David, even though he's a great warrior, such a great warrior that later on God doesn't allow him to build the temple, remember, because he said your hands are, are full of blood. He was a great warrior, but you never see him going out in his own physical strength and just wiping people out in anger because something bad has happened. He seeks God. David's strength is in God. He strengthened himself in the Lord of God. You know that David composed many of the Psalms, and one of them is the 56th Psalm. Uh, listen to a couple of verses from it, beginning in verse 3. David wrote, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now those words reflect a strong heart. A David strengthened himself in the Lord as God. But what does that mean, sort of practically speaking? How did he do that? Let's close with a few thoughts on that. Did you pick up on what David did, did next in the story? It says he sought God's will. Think about it. He actually stopped to ask God whether or not he ought to set out after the guys who had burned his city to the ground and stolen all the families, including his. I'm not sure I could have done that. I mean, wouldn't you be just so sure that your cause was just and that you were in the right? Why stop and pray, right? Surely God would agree with our plan. But David, he of the strong heart, even when he had to be convinced he was in the right, because he had, he had been treated unjustly, even then he sought God's advice. He sought God's permission. He called the priest and, and asked the priest to inquire of God, should I go after them or not? And as, as we heard, God, of course, says, go. But, but just the fact, you see, that, that David stopped to ask, that he sought God first, shows his strength, shows his total reliance, not on himself, not on his own powers, his own sense of justice and right and wrong in the American way but his total reliance on Yahweh God. That's, that's what he went after. So he seeks God, and then he acts. With God's permission, uh, David leads his men on an expedition that would be successful because it was blessed by God. Not because he was a great warrior and had a great plan, but God blessed their mission. And, and all their wives and children are recovered, amazingly. And there's actually some, some other really cool things that happened as well, which I'm not going to go into in this uh, message, but I encourage you to look at it. David 
No, he's a strong-hearted person because when he found himself in a tight spot, he strengthened himself in the Lord by seeking God's will and then acting upon it. Well, we might ask ourselves, as we try to apply this, how our heart compares to this. I want to challenge you to read and study in your own time the rest of 1 Samuel chapter 30. Uh, because as I said, uh, there are some awesome things in the rest of this story. Uh, let me tease you with just a hint. Uh, there is what I would call a great foreshadowing of the gospel in what happens with David and his men in the rest of this story. In fact, it sounds very much like one of the parables of the kingdom that Jesus told. Um, it happens at a brook. And now, down in West Virginia, we call that a crick. But it was a brook that had a name. It was called Besor, the brook Besor. Besor is a very interesting name because in the Hebrew language, it means, we get this, it means to tell good news. The whole story is resolved at a place that we might call Gospel Creek or Good News Creek. And I hope that intrigues you enough to, to read further and see what happens in the rest of the story. I hope this study has uh, challenged you and encouraged you tonight. Maybe it's uh, one of those stories that uh, you haven't heard about, David or at least thought about in a while. Uh, it's certainly something that has built me up and encouraged me. Uh, I encourage you to just keep on uh, doing well and praying and looking out for one another, praying that soon we can be back together face-to-face -face as a family and, and hope that all you and your loved ones are, are physically well and that you're using this time to draw closer to one another and to God. God bless you. And have a great evening.